and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Welcome to the 50th episode of The Spectrum Show. In this special anniversary show, I'm going to take a look back at the last three years. I'll take a look at Sinclair's last Spectrum and review some older classics. We'll also catch up with some type-ins. And overall, it's a general free-for-all, so enjoy. The show has, at the time this episode was released, been running for over three years, with the very first episode going live on YouTube on the 21st of April 2012. It was only meant to be a bit of an experiment, and here we are all those years later, celebrating the 50th show. When it started, my Spectrum collection was quite small. One working rubber keyed machine, one broken 48k model, one working 48k plus, and another broken 48k one, and probably about 20 games. Shortly after the first episode went out, a friend of mine got in touch and offered me his old collection, free of charge. I immediately took him up on this offer, and found myself with another 48k plus, a wafer drive, some joysticks, and about 20 games. The wafer drive was reviewed in episode 2, and I enjoyed setting that up so much that I soon found myself on eBay looking for more things to play with. By now it was clear to me the show would carry on. I bought a huge stack of games, and the odd peripheral here and there when the price was right, and slowly my collection grew. As the show moved on, the format changed only slightly to keep things fresh, with game reviews and hardware reviews, along with a new section being permanent features. Some additions were not always greeted with enthusiasm. The typing section, for example, I think received mixed opinions, but the demo feature seemed to go down well. I tried to cover the whole Spectrum scene and everything it can be used for, not just games, although it is a cracking games machine. Over the 50 episodes, I've reviewed about 150 games, owning most of them and playing them on real hardware where possible. The total running time of the shows, if you played them back to back, would keep you busy for well over 24 hours. But where did it all start? Jumping back to 1981 when I bought my first computer, the Sinclair ZX81. Why did I buy it? Well, I was an eager games player, but didn't have the nerve, or cash, to play the arcades. I knew it was a waste of money because I was rubbish at games, so I hung around watching other players, wishing I could do it for free, and when the ZX81 arrived, I could. It didn't have colour, or sound, or high resolution graphics, but a vivid imagination was all you needed. The keyboard was a bit hit and miss, and the famous Rampack Wobble caused many a gaming session to end in frustration, but it was brilliant all the same. When the Spectrum arrived on the 21st of April 1982, I had already saved up the money I needed to get one. Hold on though, I have just realised something spooky. The Spectrum was released on the 21st of April, and the Spectrum show started on the 21st of April. That wasn't planned either, that's cool. The Spectrum gave us colour, high resolution graphics, sound, a better keyboard, and 16 or 48k of RAM. How would we use that much? Games began to arrive thick and fast, dragging the machine from a hobbyist project to the most popular and best supported system in the UK. I had already started writing my own basic games on the ZX81, and soon moved over to the Spectrum, and my time was split between playing and writing games. By the time the 48K Plus came out, I already had a permanent replacement keyboard, the low profile, so I didn't opt for that one. I was still pushing the machine though, running my own bulletin board system, from twin micro drives. I updated my modem to a Voyager 7, updated the keyboard to a Saiga Emperor, and kept on coding. I kept my Spectrum until the late 1980s, where, after a very brief fling with a Commodore 64, I sold all my kit and bought an Amiga 500. It was something I regretted straight away, and only when PC emulation arrived did I get back into the Sinclair machines. It wasn't long after this that a friend was emigrating and offered me his Spectrum. I grabbed it with both hands, and still have it today. The 48K and 48K Plus were the only machines I had originally, but by the time the 128K machine arrived, I was aiming for the Amiga. When the show started to get more reviews, I was tempted into buying more machines, 
and I had admired the Plus 3 for ages. I know it wasn't a Sinclair machine, it was built by Amstrad, but it looked great and had a proper keyboard, RGB output and a disk drive. Soon after that I bought a Div IDE, and that transformed the machine for me and I was hooked again. Soon after that I got a cheap Plus 2 machine, another great computer, and ideal for loading tape games the way they were meant to be loaded. The only other machine now was a 128, the last Sinclair Spectrum, and the one that always pulled huge prices on eBay. There was no way was I going to pay 500 quid for a machine, no matter how good it was, but luck must have shined, and the same friend that gave me his wafer drive all those years ago spotted a machine on a local seller site. He sent me a text message at midnight, asking me if I wanted a specky. I said, not too politely, no thanks. He persisted, saying it had 25 games with it. And to cut a long story short, it turned out to be a 1 to 8 machine, with games, and the seller was asking 40 quid. That machine was soon in my grubby hands, and it worked. I sent it straight to Mutant Caterpillar for a full service, and now it's back. So, what is it like? First rumoured around May 1985 in Popular Computing Weekly, the Spectrum 1 to 8 was very much a must have machine. It was the old Spectrum we all loved, but with more. It was also around this time that cracks began to appear in Sinclair's business, with the Robert Maxwell takeover causing headlines. This never came to fruition though. Time marched on, and other companies were also in the race to produce 1 to 8K machines with the PCW show rumoured to be the official announcement of Sinclair's challenge, with the unit being available to the public by September. It was a time of turmoil, and the machine failed to appear, despite Sinclair's future beginning to look up. As October arrived, the machine was finally launched, but only in Spain. This was said to allow for stocks of the Plus machine to be sold, before introducing the more powerful Micro. As November arrived, Sinclair hinted that the machine would be available in the new year. December brought news that the first batches of the machines had arrived in the UK, but were yet still unavailable to buy. Could this be stocks in preparation for the launch? Sinclair refused to comment. January and the software houses were gearing up for the release, and finally, in February, the machine arrived for general sale. The memory, as expected, had been increased from 48 to 1 to 8K. This meant that games could be massive. On the downside, it did take a long time for them to load, and the memory was not all in one chunk. Developers had to switch between 16K banks. The sound had been changed too. Not only did it maintain the original beeper, but now gave us an AY chip. It wasn't as good as the Commodores, but it could produce some pretty good music. The machine looked like the 48K Plus model, but was larger and much heavier due to the heat sink on the right hand side. This metal styling soon gave the machine its famous nickname, the Toast Rack. Around the back we still had the expansion port, but now we were given other exciting things. An RGB port to connect the machine to a monitor, but this would not transfer sound, that still had to come via the RF socket. And there was no speaker in this model, so that was a bit of a problem for monitor users. There was a serial port, there was also a keypad socket at the front. This allowed you to use a separate numeric keypad, but this was only available in Spain for some reason. The operating system had been given a makeover too. We now get a menu when the machine turns on, allowing tape loading without typing commands, and a new 1 to 8K basic that did away with the traditional keyword entry of the 48K models and allowed typing in the normal manner. In operation, it's pretty much what you would expect. It's a spectrum. It looks good, it feels good, it sounds good, and it plays good. Sinclair had big plans for this machine. They wanted to develop a disk drive for it, and eventually even wafer scale technology that Clive had been working on when things went bad. As it turned out, Alan Sugar used it as the base to build the Amstrad models, with the first plus two, the grey one, being more or less a 1 to 8K machine with a cassette strapped onto it. A great machine then, that marks a milestone in home computer history, and it's great to finally get my hands on one. The games companies had been preparing releases for some time, but was there any real difference between the old 48k offerings and the new 1 to 8k Behemoth? Considering there were no graphical enhancements to the new machine, 
the best gamers could hope for was larger games and better sound. The extra memory meant developers could utilise the additional storage to swap out graphics, meaning, hopefully, games could be more content rich. Very few companies use this though, instead opting to maintain backward compatibility with the older machines by auto-detecting the RAM during the load. If the machine was a 1 to 8K model, the game would load all the levels in one chunk. If it was a 48K model, the levels would load individually, as required. Looking at the games now, I think the sound and extra memory spurred the game developers and gave them extra incentive to stick with the 8 bits in the shadow of the 16-bit machine that were just around the corner. For gamers though, without the graphical changes, the sound was the main draw. Games could be played while three-channel music accompanied the action, improving the atmosphere or providing a thumping tune to race or fight to. Let's take a look at one game, Midnight Resistance, as an example. This classic run and gun game was released into the arcades in 1989 by Data East, with many unique gameplay elements. The plot revolves around rescuing your family from someone called King Crimson, at least in the arcade and Spectrum versions. There are level bosses and weapon upgrades, and all manner of places to walk, jump, crawl, drop and climb through. On the 48k version, we get nice graphics and good sound effects. The game moves along at a fair pace, although the smooth continual scrolling of the arcades is replaced by push scrolling, and with the difficulty lower than the arcade, it makes for a fine game. So what does the 1 to 8k version offer? For a start it loads in one go, and secondly, as you can probably tell, it adds the soundtrack. The graphics and gameplay are the same, and it's a great game and a fantastic conversion. The first level is sufficiently easy to introduce the player to the control system, but still has a few tricky places like the scaffolding, where you have to jump and fire diagonally to get past the guards. As each guard dies, they leave behind a token. Collecting these is essential, as you use them later on to buy better weapons. At the end of the level is a large tank to take out. Then it's up the ladder, through the door, and into the weapons room. Here you can use your tokens to buy bigger guns and additional items to your backpack, like homing missiles. Choosing the right weapon for the job is down to familiarity of the game, and which level's coming next, and a good choice should make things a lot easier. As the levels progress, the different stages of the arcade version are presented in glorious spectrum vision, and the developers have done a fabulous job here. The graphics are well drawn, smooth and very colourful. With weapons like rain, the screen is often filled with fast moving objects, and the game shows very little slowdown. This game is not easy, and things get gradually harder the further you get. In fact, it got too hard for me, so I had to revert to watching the RZX playback. Sound is used well, and the music adds that little bit extra. And for any 48k owners that were thinking about doing the upgrade to the newer machine, then games like this would certainly help make the choice. Getting used to the controls is important, because going in green will make for a very difficult game indeed. Knowledge of the arcade game will also help, as the stages have been replicated in great detail. This is generally known as one of the best games for the Spectrum, and you can see why. Everything fits together so well, and you just want to get back in and have another go. An excellent game then. One of the first games to be released for the 1 to 8 machine was Daily Thompson's Super Test from Ocean. But I haven't got that one, so we'll look at the follow-up instead. Hey, it's my show. Quit moaning. Daily Thompson's Olympic Challenge was released 
1988, again by Ocean, to tie in with the Seoul Olympic Games of the same year. Sadly, Daly's time was coming to an end by this point, and he could only manage fourth. Still, he could come home and play this game and cheer himself up. I want to show you the box content first, because it's quite impressive. The large box contains many things. First, a warning for humble 48k users about how to load the game properly. Next comes the Ocean catalogue from 1988, some nice titles in there, and a bit of free advertising. Then there's a small instruction sheet. Next, as promised on the outer box, a giant poster that contains lots of information about the Olympics, including world records. And finally, the two cassettes. One of them has a free audio track, which is, well, I'll let you decide. So let's get to the game then. The first thing you have to do is a bit of training. This takes the form of three stages. The first one is weights, and to complete this, you just sit and hammer the keys. In fact, you do all of this for all of the training events, and pretty much most of the game. The graphics are well drawn though, as Daly lifts the weights, does sit-ups, and finally goes through some squats. But what does all this mean? Well, as you train, a bottle of Lucozade slowly fills up. This is the first of two product placements here. The more the bottle fills up, the better your stamina and performance will be in the real events. That is, if your keyboard survives. So after destroying a few keys, you finally get to the meat of the game. First up though, you have to choose the correct footwear, and you have to do this for each event. And here we get the second product placement, Adidas. Or, as we used to call them in my day, Adidas. You pick the right one and your performance will improve. There's no real need for this, apart from to get product placement in I suppose, but it just delays getting into the game. And on to the first event then, and the 100 meters. You should know by now that there's little skill involved in these types of games, it's just a matter of hitting the keys or waggling the joystick as fast as you can. As you bash away, daily sprints down the track, and you have to beat a qualifying score set at the bottom of the screen. I must be getting old because I found this very difficult to beat, and I did it using the right footwear too. Next event is the long jump. You run down the track and hit the fire, or the M key, at the right time, and daily will jump. Again, I failed this. But here's how it should look. Next comes the shot put. Again, you just hammer the keys for a small amount of time and press the fire when Daly begins to throw. If you fail these events, it's game over. If you complete them, you can then move on and do the other stages. Next comes the high jump more key mashing and a press of the fire button, the 400 meters, more key bashing, the 110 meters hurdles, more key bashing but this time you get to jump a little bit, the discus, more key bashing, the pole vault, more key bashing and some fire button pressing. This section the angle changes, which is a little confusing. Then we get the javelin, more key bashing to run, get the angle right and fire. And finally the last one, the 1500 meters. Again, more key mashing. I was never a fan of these types of games, and to me there was no real skill. The graphics, as you can see, are great, they're well drawn and well animated, although the crowd seemed to be as bored as I was. Sound is very limited, apart from the tune between stages, there is just a few odd beeps here and there, and the sound of running. Although, to be honest, if you're actually playing this game, you'll be too busy smashing the keys to worry about sound.
If you enjoy hitting two keys one after the other for about 30 minutes, give this one a try. Otherwise, save your keyboard and go find something else. Yes, Typing Corner is back for this episode. I had some games left over from Series 4 that have not been seen since they were first published, and I thought this would be a good time to share them. First up is Galactoids by Gavin Smith, kindly sent to us by Bootlegger. This impressive game was published in the April-May 1984 issue of ZX Computing. The listing was large and contained just machine code, a daunting task for any user. Once typed in though, even though the intro screen names the game as Invaders, the game is, as you would expect, a Galaxian-style game. Large aliens swoop about, and you have to dodge their bombs and shoot them. The game is good for a typing, and a nice little shooter. It's all good fun, certainly worth a look. On to the next one then, and we have Diver, by John Durst, published in the December 1983 issue of Popular Computing Weekly. You have to guide your diver around undersea caves in the search of treasure. You can't see the treasure until you're very close to it, but your diving suit turns a different colour the closer you get to the level of the treasure, with white being the nearest. Using this you can move around the caves with the cursor keys trying to locate it. There are stingrays though, who send shockwaves out which reduces your oxygen and you only have a limited supply to get the treasure and get out again. You can blast through the rocks if you want, but this awakens an octopus that isn't too happy about things. Not a bad little game then. Next we have a massive typing, seven pages of it, kindly sent in again by Bootlegger. This is Puyan by PQ Productions, originally published in the December 1985 issue of ZX Computing. There are three sections to the game, section one and you have to stop the wolves from ballooning down to the ground to eat the little piglets in the house. To do this, you simply shoot the balloons. If three wolves land, however, your piglets have gone and the game ends. Section 2, and you have to shoot as many balloons as possible to get a high score. On the last stage, you have to shoot the wolves as they balloon upwards to try and escape. If enough wolves escape, they join forces and drop a boulder on your head. It's all good fun with decent graphics, and certainly worth a play. Lastly we have Save the Chickens, originally published in the June 1984 issue of Big K, and this game again was sent in by Bootlegger. The idea is that you have to guide your newly hatched chickens to safety in the hen coop at the bottom of the screen. In their way are ponds and white rabbits, and if that's not enough, there's a fox that chases them. This is a simple game that's easy to play, but it doesn't really give us anything different. Still, not a bad game for free. This is probably the first time that all of these games have been seen, since they were originally published. They will be available to download from my blog shortly. Well, 
Well, that's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon. to 8k version is available free but has a different fourth level in the paid bit in the paid for but in the the dual one the dual 1 to 8k drives use the same continuous tape loop system like the micro drive but use lower quality tape that inevitably that inevitably ne that inevitab bleh bleh bleh. Life Sinclair has been awarded a knighthood in the Queen's Birthday Honours list. Birthday list honours. Birthday honours list. Yeah. Life Sinclair has been awarded a knighthood in the clean in the Queen's oh Christ. Your craft can shoot the nest guards, but not the aliens themselves. Who on earth sent a shit like that on such a mission? But obviously, uh, again. Who on earth sent a ship like? Who on earth sent a shit? Sh oh, sent a shit, guys. Who on earth sent a shit like that to tackle the. Oh. The game replaces the moon buggy of the arcade with a large steam locomotive and the aliens with various nasties like hamburgers. Mm, hamburgers. The revolution of the. Revolution? God. The resolution. Was it? The, re the resolution of the laptop had to be charged. Oh, gold. Microcraft's product con Microcraft's products consist of three packages: basis, basis, uh, basic protect, protect, protest. Uh, Basic Protectrum, pre prote basic Protectrum, which stops merging and listing to screen or printer, and will corrupt the code if triggered. Machine code protect, protect, uh, machine protect, uh, machine code protect, machine code Protectrum, machine code Protectrum does the, does the same. Thing. And finally, anti copier Protectrum, protect, protect, anti packet. What a stupid bloody name. If you're a good player, unlike myself, you can get to fight Mean Monkey, Barmy Bee, Crazy Cat, Perilous Parrot, Mad Dog, and finally, f***ing crazy loony lobster